think you're going to have a really, really enjoyable class. Um, we're going to very quickly disappear to deal with some mundane logistics of parking that just needs to happen. Um, so I'm going to leave you with Sharon Jeet to get started, and we'll be back in about 10 minutes. Yep. Okay. Sure, thank you. And you can go back to the sketchy sheet from there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They even tow brilliant sit-up players. <laughs> 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 okay, let's go. Hello, friends. It is an utmost honor to be here among you. And I was just sharing with Adrian that I have been among your ranks, sitting there, mm -hmm. watching wonderful teachers and instructors speaking from this platform. I was been in different role in this institute. I have been a teacher, I have been a performer, I have performed for arts at one for several times and again it is my great privilege to be here amidst you in this musical energy and synergy that we bring to this room. My name is Sharanji and I am an Indian classical sitar student and I have been playing sitar for about 15 years and uh, I have been told that you all have done some project work and you have been made familiar with the different aspects of Indian classical music. So, but I know that this, this time that we live in, all the universal ideas and philosophies are already out there. You can look up online, you can find all the, all the things which are part of musical definitions and literature. So I will not take you on that road. I rather, I will share my own personal experiences, my own opinions, and they, you don't have to agree to it, you don't have to take that as facts, you can defer, you can ignore, the whole attempt here is that we all are travelers or rather wanderers of this realm of music and we are gonna share our experiences together. So if I am there and I have seen something special, which I believe is special, I will bring forth that. And if that helps you in navigating yourself in this musical world, that, that would be my success. So there's two ways to do it. Uh, one is that I can start from the history and all the things and I can follow a particular hierarchy of what happened, how it happened and what we are doing right now. Or I can leave it open to you guys and you can, if there's any inquisitive self who want to bring a question forward, I will be in the service of that. Yes, please. It would be great if you could just start with the historical thing and then we could have a basis to ask questions. Sure, let's do this. So you know, Indian classical music is one of the longest surviving traditions of classical arts in this world. I would say about 5,000 years in evolution and still evolving. Uh, India as a subcontinent saw its, its, its first civilization in Vedic times, which is a more so a solidified cultural integrated civilization which has lasted this long. And in Vedic times, there were four main texts which described or defined what kind of life you have to lead. They were not just religious texts, they were more so a spiritual and more so a, a social text or definition that what kind of life you have to live. And you will be surprised out of those four, one was completely about music. So by that you get an idea that how important, how uh, imperative music was for that civilization. That is called Sam Ved. Samved is the name of the text where you have these whole set of shlokas which are poetic couplets in Sanskrit which are set to music. Initially in Indian music there was, uh, the progression of Indian music happened like this, that earlier there was group and now we have individuals. Which is a little bit contrary to how West, Western music evolved. Now you have orchestras which played, plays beautifully in, in, in synchronized form. But in Indian music it became more individualistic later on. But it started as a group singing in the temples or shrines, which was called Sam Gan. And I invite you all to ask anything, anytime. If you have something to share, you're more than free to do that. So Sam Gan is a process where you have these group of singers and this Vedic text Sam Ved, which is sung into three in three notes. How many of you like to sing here? Lovely. So let's let's do a little bit of singing here, okay? Just, just follow me and see how you feel. Sa, just follow this syllable. Sa, Sa. And then the next note that we went is a minor interval from the do, which is a flat second. 
were the foundation of all samga mm. various permutation and combinations of these made a whole like a structured approach to samga for example if we take a, a, a sanskrit verse how would that sound in these notes om bhur bhuvaswaha tasavitu varnayam bhargo devasya dhimahi dhiyo so you see, we just used three notes and we created a whole time out of it. But this happened 5,000 years back. Later on, we progressed into more so a 7, 12 tone structure. Mm. And then, now what we deal with is 22 microtonal structures. Indian classical music is not about 12 tones. It is about 22 microtones. And because notes are so fluid in there, so you can choose a different second every time for a different rag. How many of you know what a rag is? Yes. Like a collection of pitches, almost like a like what we would call a scale. So almost like a scale collection of pitches, that's absolutely right. Anything else? Anybody would like to add? Okay, that's right. It's, it's a set of notes and then you have some given rules how to use them note, those, those notes. And then there's a particular time to that, to that rag when, when it blossoms the most. It relates to the kind of atmosphere that nature creates at a particular time of the day or the season. So then, when ragas happen, we don't think of ragas as, as tonal structures. We think of them as microtonal structures. Because sometimes, there might be just two rags with absolutely same notes. Two rags with two pentatonic rags. Sa re ga pa da sa da pa ga re sa. That's a pentatonic scale. But there might be another pentatonic scale which has a sixth a little bit sharper. Sa re ga pa da sa da pa ga re sa. Because we have not 22 microtones, so we can move the 6th or the 4th or whichever note a little bit up or down. So Indian music is based upon 22 microtones. After Samgan or after Vedic period came a time when classical music went to the courts of the kings. And that's when real evolution in the emotional aspect of music started happening because now music was not just a spiritual thing, but it was, it was an element of entertainment, intellectual entertainment and spirituality. And you can imagine if you are in, in the courts of the kings, you, you must be one of the best musicians. So, and because you are so favored and you are at a, such a, at, a, at, a, at a platform that what you do will become the culture of the music. So over the years, there was this sublime level of music happening in the court, which became a very classical art. What is classical? The music of the classes, music of the intellectual classes. What is ma other music is the music of the masses. The most music that we hear today is the music of the masses, which actually filters through all sort of intellectual levels, all sort of listening habits and all sort of listening um, habits. So that is music of the masses. But classes is something which, is, which requires a little bit more subtlety, a deeper understanding of the aspects of music and the fine. So the subtler the music became, it became more classical. And then with the evolution over several years, with the coming of the mass media and all that, now we had recently Pandit Ravi Shankar and lots of other great musicians. One of my uh, the, uh, the, uh, founders of my tradition, Ustad Vilayat Khantwal, they globalized Indian classical music and now it is kind of recognized everywhere where it is more so related to a spiritual side of music. And that is because Indian classical music is so organic in nature. The instruments are very organic. The kind of approach we take is 95% improvised we follow a particular format to that, but still within the liber within the discipline, there's a liberty. And the discipline only serves for you to be more free because you're not lost. So that is the kind of Indian classical music we have right now. So anything you would like to ask about that? So Indian classical music, technically has two branches. One is the melodic aspect of it and one is the uh, rhythmic aspect. The melodic, we, we just talked about it, is called rag or rag. R-A-A-G is a better way to call it rag. 
and then we have the rhythmic aspect of it which is called lay lay you can write it l a y lay lay is more important than rag because time is the principle of the note as well melody as well would you agree or not you would right why is so yes please because music happens in time right music happens in time the dimension that music happens is time right and anything else anybody would like to add does it tie into the concept of the seasons and like you're saying how the some of the format rules are kind of based on seasonal and time and stuff yeah that's right that's right let me let me let me put the question back again so melody is based upon the lay or the time what do you take from that why lay or the or the time is primary to the melody yes sir the rhythm is inherent in melody how is that uh, because all melody would have a rhythmic element to it all melody think about the units of melody think about the units of melody what what are the units of melody what is melody made up of pitches pitches so what do we get from that yes oh, i was going to say time and pitch time and pitch so let me let me give you my perspective on it you know scientifically it's a very very common understanding that when a string vibrates it has oscillations it has timing to it that creates a melody so every time even a melody a pitch a sound happens it comes from lay from time that's how we look into melody mm -hmm. the lay is the foundation of everything even the melody you can't have melody without the time mm -hmm. so that is what i was trying to say so now we have these these two aspects of music one is lay one is melody melody is quite simple to understand in comparison to lay though they both require several decades to really get a a gist of them but here what is lay is just a consistent motion of time it's a flow lay is a flow it is not really <laughs> uh distinguishable events in time no it's a consistent flow that's lay lay can have one value to it one 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 there's always two in the one but still we think of it as one there cannot be one without two right so there is that consistency in lay but when you put three or four events together which have different uh pitch value or sound value to it that becomes a tal tal is this rhythmic cycle which goes around for example a four beat cycle 1234123412341234 at a very fundamental level it's just that's one it's just that one but we have emphasized the one a little bit more so in our mind it creates an illusion that there is a more structure of four than just 121212 right so that is called tal so tal is a rhythmic cycle so when we improvise you know there is a instrument called tabla tabla is this pair of drums and then you play it with sitar or any other indian classical music uh, instrumental or vocal style or you have pakhavaj how many of you are familiar with pakhavaj it's an ancient form of tabla it's a little bit more masculine it's heavy it's played from the side rather from the top so there are several indian instruments they usually play tals So, for example, we have a language of tabla and rhythm. The, every sound you produce on these instruments has a name to it. I can recite some of those. Is like a 12-beat cycle will sound like this: din din dhagi tikr tu na katta dhagi tikr din na din din dhagi tikr tu na katta dhagi tikr din na. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Hmm? Din din dhagi tikr tu na katta dhagi tikr din na. Din din dhagi tikr tu na katta dhagi tikr din na. That's a 12 beat cycle. That 16 beat cycle would sound like this: da din din da da din din da din din da tik din din da da din din da da din din da da din din da tik din din da. Eight beat cycles: da ge na ti na ke din na da ge na ti na ke din na one two three four one two three four one two three four five six seven eight da ge na ti na ke din na da ge na ti na ke din na. A three beat cycles: da din na da ge din na. A swing: it's a word da din na um pa pa da din na da din na. These all are called tals. and then with the nature of the rag that you are playing with the nature of melody or expression you want to share you have a whole 
uh, spectrum of 108 tiles to choose from. Right? It can be, there can be two 16 bit cycles, but with different in, it's sort of uh, swing to them, sort of groove to them, sort of grit to them. Right? For example, 12 bit cycle that I just said, din din dha gati gati muna katta dha gati gati dha versus dha dha din ta tete dha din ta tete gati 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 gati. So first one has more feminine value to it. Din din dha gati gati muna katta dha gati gati din na. Whereas the second one, dha dha din ta tete dha din ta tete gati 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 has more of that, that strength to it, that more masculinity to it. So there can be various ways to look at ta. Any question about that? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, so, back in the original Ragdip that was based on music, yes. were the Tals part of that? Did they go back that far or did they evolve more recently? Uh, Tals are very ancient, and but for the Samgan, Tal was not a very uh, intrinsic element to that. Okay. They might have or they might not have is still a question, but it wasn't as complex as I am telling you right now. So there might be a, just a pulse to it, but the way we do it now is more so very complicated because there's uh, what has happened over the years that these two branches, they evolved on their own, right? And then eventually they merged. So suddenly this tal, somebody is doing tal and over generations they are trying to see what can they do with this. And they have reached a place of great creativity, uh, immense dexterity and virtuosity in Tal, and the melody is rising here too. And ultimately they come together face to face. And that makes Indian classical music the complex form it has right now. I yes. Have a question, sorry. So when a, when a tabla player improvises, do they improvise based on which of the 108 tals they select, or do they change, do they have the freedom to change the tals as they go along? Good question. So when a tabla player improvises, first of all, wh what role is the tabla player actually playing right now? If the tabla player has a secondary accompanying role, for example, let's say that a sitar player is performing and it's his concert and he is taking the main lead for most of it. There will be a time when it will be a turn taken by a tabla player to show his ability to uh, do something interesting with the tal. If sitar player chooses to play something in 16 beats, in let's say a medium speed, 16 beat or a fast speed 16 beat. Tabla player will actually improvise on the same speed. What happens is that I was saying that 95% is improvised, 5% would be a composition. So when tabla player is improvising, the sitar player will actually hold a kind of a melody to keep the time for the tabla player. You can call it an ostinato or something of that sort, just a melody. And tabla player is playing his improvisation and he's gonna come to the first beat of that melody after he's done with the improvisation. Mm -hmm. Now within that improvisation, if imagine the tabla player is playing 16 beat cycle because the tabla player is a 16 beat cycle, he can go to 12 beat cycle. But imagine this, this is the size of 16 beat cycle, a cycle. The 12 beat has to be the same size. The one should be at the same place, you see? For example, there's simple exercises, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three. You see what I mean? Oh, so, wow. So right? they change, they, the pulse is the same. Yeah, pulse is the, first beat is called sum. What is the first beat called in Indian classical music? Uh, music? Sum. Say that after me, sum. Sum. Yes. So it's S-A-M, Sam, but sum, okay? <laughs> so sum is the, is the heaviest, most, gravitating beat in a cycle. You know when it comes. Now I have to catch that sum. My composition will be made in a sense that it will also have an emphasized note on that sum. Improvising on that. So you're always in that cycle and you're improvising. And there's there's different ways to do it. We will not get into those complexities today, but there's 
there's the highs and counter rhythms and micro beats and seven and a half beats and quarter to nine beats and 13 and a half beats. So that is for you all to do that. Now, here we have Tals. Now we let's talk about Rag. Rag is, uh, yeah, I'll let, it, let you guide me about the Rag. What is a Rag? The three things we, which came up earlier was that it's a, it's a set of note and it has uh, an ascending and descending and it's similar to scale. What else? Yes. Very specific patterns. Okay, sure. And yes, please. It's based on rhythm. It's based on rhythm. Okay, we can say that. Yes, sir. Well, you can say this a similar thing that it, uh, it guides how the patterns and how melodies are formed. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's well said. Yes, please. Very good, yeah. That means you have learned a lot, yes. <laughs> That's a good thing, very nice. I'm very glad, yes. Anything else? Okay, let's do this exercise here. I'll give you three notes. Sa, re, ga, do, re, mi. Sa, re, ga. That's your rag. Today we are working on a three beat, three notes rag. Well, actually there's no three notes rag. Basically you need at least five notes to make a rag. But today, just for now, we have three notes, and a rag is called. Uh, but but what is this class called? What is what? The class is called. What's the name of the? Oh, it's music. Music. The rag is called music. Okay. So let's let's do this rag together. Now we have sare ga. I tell you that ga is the most important note, and whenever you go to ga, you have to vibrate it from re and then ga, or whenever you come to re. You have to come back to Re after touching the ga. Okay, let's see how many phrases we can come up with. Let me start. Sa re ga. Sa ga re. Let's do both again. Sa that we like self created that let's start everything from sa that's fine and then we have this idea of going more so flowing between re and ga right so that is in crux a rag you just not only go from tone to tone but you actually go between the tone in classical music journey between the tone matters more than the tone i think in any form of art journey to the destination is not as, the destination is not as important as the journey is so that, that journey makes Indian classical music so more substantial as a melodic form of music because we don't have too much harmony because we kept it more melodic so we can actually do this. Mm. Now from going to one note to second note, what does that mean? Improvisation. Yeah, it allows more improvisation. If you, if like, if you go, do, re, mi, do re mi, yes. 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 We use whole tones and semitones, and they're tones, mm -hmm. but all those tones are not mathematically static every time. Oh. They change as per the rhythm. Yes, sir. Uh, 
um, going from one note to another uh, with the intention of motion? There's motion, right? There's more life. There's more life. It's more alive. So because it's a melodic form which is mostly improvised, we get more possibilities. There's more potential if you can go between the notes because there's endless ways to do that. Mm -hmm. You can start very slow and reach the other note with a little bit more velocity. You can shake, vibrate between two notes, which is called gamma. We have names of these techniques called gamma, mean. When you go from one note to the other, touching all the microtonal possibilities, that's called mean. Mm. When you vibrate between two notes, this is called gamma. When you do a little bit of uh, a jerk kind of a movement, this is called khatka. So there are, there are various names to these, these ideas which you are using to create a very beautiful melody. Let me give you an, another example of just, I'll just sing for you guys a little bit of a melody. Tell me what mode it is, okay? Sa mere pa ma re ma ka pa re sa mere ma da ni da pa re ma ka re ga re sa What do you think? Ready? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So there's a sharp fourth there. Sare gama, sare gama pa, sare gama pa da, sare gama pa da ni, ni da ma ga re, re ni da ma ga re, re ga ma pa ma ga re ga re ni sa. So we have become so fluent with these tones that we, it becomes our, our usual language to talk, converse between musicians. But go, how about pa ma ga re ga re sa? What do you think about that? Maybe you do Pama Rega in Nidesa. That's even better. But can we do Nide Pama Rega in Nida Pama Rega in Nidesa? Yeah, that's that's you're fusing both of them. How about we emphasize on me a little bit more? Dani Nini Pata Dana Mapa Nida Pama Pama Pata Nini Nida Nida Pata Mapa Nida Pama Gari. So this is how Indian classical musicians, especially Raga musicians, they talk because we are improvising all the time. That is what's happening in our mind. So that's a rag where you have these this language of tones, and you are expressing yourself. What is music anyways? French French calls it a decorative passing of time. A decorative passing of time. Beautiful. Yeah, I like that description. A decorative passing of time. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. You have this time in your hand, okay? And there are enormous possibilities to do with that time. You, that is all we have. What is that that you can do to really be free with that time? Time is a, is, is a manacle, is a binding, but it also is freedom because without time we cannot move. But time also restricts us how much where, how, what to do. The subtler your life force becomes, the subtler you become in your expression, the finer you become in your, in your expression, the less is the grasp of time on you. Mundane things sort of are too heavy on the dimension of time. But the finer you become, the more artistic you become, your perspective becomes like that arrow that can pierce between snowflakes, the freer you are, because the time has become so soft and still for you, it flows very gently. In that liberty, a human expression of music breathes. Mm. Music is just a way to be free in your expression. Music is beyond judgment if we, if we really allow it to pass through our soul, not just to our mind, and it can, we can certainly do that with that. And eventually I tell you this, and it's my opinion, but it's also my experience, that there's a place in the realm of music where there's no sound, there's no tone, and there's no beat. 
And I'm not referring to silence. There's music without sound, there's music without tal and rag. But it's not silence. It's parallel to silence, but it's not silence. Silence in which I'm referring to, even that is not there, that I would consider silence. But music is not really the sound of the tone. It's something else, nameless, entity. So that is the pursuit of Indian classical music. That you spend your whole life pursuing one rag, one tone at a time. So that you become one with it. There's no distinction between you and the music that you're doing. You have to become music. That's the spiritual idea or that's the main idea behind Indian music. So it's a way to surrender or to, or to blend in music to an extent that music survives and you are not there. Right? Let's say one thing here, which is important for your musical journey. Okay, when we practice, and when we, in Indian music, it's called riyaz. There's two different words. Indian music musician says riyaz which in a very vernacular way translates to practice. But those who know deeper, it has a different meaning. So mostly when you say practice, practice means to get something, to have something. There is an agenda to practice and you eventually come to a place, oh, now I know this well enough, I won't get it wrong and I can play it before people or just play it for my own sake and I will be happy. Riyaz means to lose yourself. It simply means to lose yourself. So you do it so much that you are not there. Even the witness has disappeared for that music and music is there. And in that not being is the ultimate liberty. That's the pursuit of Indian classical music. Now we have, yes please. That's the same, I mean, the same pursuit of yoga and a lot of other Indian faith practices. Right. They all kind of have that same, that same goal of non-being and freedom from non-being. Right. right. That's the essence of most, most ancient forms of philosophies and arts that have survived the test of time. Mm -hmm. Because eventually what happens is that coloring of truth is the function of mind. So when truth might be there and we might perceive truth as truth, but it is colored. But to really perceive the truth, the mind has to get out of the way. The highest expression that can come out of a musician, most of you are a musician, is when you are not doing it. And I'm sure you must have experienced this several times when things happen to you and you are just there in awe that how did that happen to me? <laughs> how can I play or sing so beautiful? And how did I felt it so deeply? It might just be the same note, but this time I felt it so differently. So you know, there are these different walls of subtleties and of macro and micro parts. If you're listening from your ears, ladies and gentlemen, you're just listening to sound. You're just listening to the sound, the energy which vibrates your eardrums and all that. Now if you're listening from your mind, the experience condition you that has been created in you is trying to fit that sound into these boxes, which is from your previous experience that I, oh, this reminds me of that season because you have experienced it. This reminds me of that incense that I lighted because this fragrance is like this music. This reminds me of that girl or that boy. So that is when we went for a date and this is how we felt. But now if you listen from your soul, there's no coloring and you're really listening to something which is not a subject of your mind. That's the truth. And when, when we practice, that is what we pray in our practice or in our riyas, which I've just introduced to you, that when may we be able to just sing the note in its purest form without thinking if we are singing or if we are playing. For example, now we have a rag here. Ragas are made up of rasas, emotions. Okay? But eventuality of all rasas is nirras. The nine emotions which come out of nirras. No emotion, blankness. But nine emotions are, for example, there's a rag about anger as well. Even negative emotions are there. Indian classical text or theory provides you with enough instruments to express everything that you can express. Anger, rage, disgust, all those emotions are there. There's beauty, there's peace, there's love, romance, there's devotion, 
it surrender also for example sa re ga in this re and ga second and the third tone there is a surrender re ga by bending it and moving it slowly towards the re there is a feeling of surrender as if a river surrenders to the ocean re but there is anger sometimes pa re pa re ma ga re sa pa da pa re you see then there's more so romance da ni sa ni da ga ma da ni sa ni da ma ga ma re sa sa ga ma ni This is romance. This is a romance of union. If you unite with your love, but there is a romance in 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 separation, in pathos. Sa ga ma da ni sa ni da ma ga ga ma. Like you are in anticipation of a meal, or you are a little bit sad. So these are ragas which have different emotions. Now raga has a time to it. Maybe a season. Now we have spring. So some ragas which have the beauty of and grandiosity of a of a of a field of of daffodils and tulips blossoming, and also because of this cosmic alignment of things, spring happens. Something that can express that that is a raga of the spring. We have ragas of the autumn. We have ragas for the winter. We have ragas of the summer. But we also have ragas as per the time of the day. We have ragas for the morning, for the afternoon, for the evening. Because our mood is different, the atmosphere, the nature is different, and most of the Indian music is completely derived from the nature. Mm. So, if you, you know, I was telling this few days back to some of a group of my students. It's the same ocean you stand beside. In the morning, the waves feels different. Same velocity, same intensity of the waves. In the afternoon, the waves feel different, and in the evening, the waves have a different flavor. It's same waves. The velocity does not change. the intensity of the waves does not change but there's a feeling to them waves the waves are different because the whole ambience and the setting for those waves has changed the plot for those waves has changed so that is what we are trying to express through our music yes please is there rasa rasa yes mm. or ras meaning emotions ras means the nectar nectar of mind that's the literal definition of the word Any questions so far? Yes. So, um, when singing a rag, is it are each rag specific to a certain emotion, or can you change the emotion depending on how you sing it? Good question. A rag can have multiple emotions. A rag can have a whole array of similar, same belt of emotions, but makes different kinds of things: social sadness, emotional sadness, uh, spiritual sadness, but sadness. or different joys such as innocent joy there's a romantic joy and all that so you can take liberties of using different permutations of those notes and express something totally unique every time you do the same rag happening for 5 6000 years now and still there is every time a new artist approaches a rag it's absolutely different but it's the same and it's different improvisation allows you that but still something has happened for so many years but still has this value of novelty that it's really incredible yes so if so many rags are tied to the seasons or times of day or moments in life for an untrained person who doesn't understand that if we just you know picked up an album or not an album not too old the cd with um indian classical music and listened to it whenever it was convenient for us Would we be missing something? Would we get that? Would it sound wrong? Would we know that it wasn't? Like, would we be able to feel that it wasn't right? You would not know until today. <laughs> <laughs> But since this thought has now been given to you, so you might try to perceive all of that. You might come to a right conclusion, which is there's no right and wrong anyway with the raga theory. 
but majority has described it so and we over time get conditioned to see all those things but music is very subjective anyways i find it very hard to sit here and talk to you that's why i gave you all that disclaimer in the beginning that it's all my opinion it's subjective this and that so if you might listen to an afternoon rag and for you it might sound as a morning rag it is the morning rag for you always and okay. and that's totally accepted so it's very subjective it's very subjective it's very subjective but if you are in a group and you're training under a traditional school and that has been a, a idea driven uh, teaching method that this is how it should be you become conditioned to see all those things in those notes okay. which might serve you in understanding the music to a certain degree but as i said there's a point where you have to even shed the notes so all these philosophies with goes with music are left behind like miles from you thank you for your question yes I saw some other hands raising there. Some people, no? Yes. I have a question. Um, earlier, you were talking about how there's certain um, feminine and masculine aspects of the rag. Are specific rags um, meant to be sung by women or men, or are they interchangeable? Uh, that happens unknowingly, not not very strategically. But there are ragas which are more masculine in nature. There are ragas which sound better in a more lower sounding voice. heavier voice there are ragas which are more tenor and that level of singing required ragas so that happens a lot for example if there's a rag called darbari darbari means court room or the or the atmosphere of a court and there's king and the court is in and there's and lamps and beautiful tapestries and all that on the in the room you sing darbari it's a more masculine suited rag just by the idea of that it's a heavy gravitas and all that sort of rag that was that has happened in a in a society where where usually a king would be a male and some male dominant society so those traits happen to become a part of it but substantially there's if you take darbari and think about ghazals which is a very sufi aspect of music people would prefer maybe a female voice to that same rag right yes this is a, I mean, from my limited very limited understanding of indian philosophy When you talk about male and female, you're not necessarily talking about men and women, but isn't there a belief that within us everyone has a male and female quality? Right. right? It's just the 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 value of music is driven by two things. The music itself is driven by two things. It's a drive and it's a completion. It's the journey and the destination. It's tension and resolution. those two forms of energies potential and kinetic energies it is up to your discretion to call which male and which female but they are there mm. right so there in universally there are two energies universe is because there is nothing and a universe so it's upon our discretion to how we how we distinguish each other and what label we give them. so that's ab- absolutely there Yes. Quick question, uh, just to put into context, uh, a few of us are studying music therapy and studying to be music therapists. And when you say you listen with your mind, you color the context of it with your own personal experiences in life and your own emotion. And that's one thing that I see very valuable in music therapy and is in the individual's kind of experience and how a song could be intended to be about something else. but someone might ask the artist hey what did you write this about that and they say well if you think so then yes but even though in their head it was about something else and they wrote it from their own personal experience whereas the deep spirituality of a lot of this uh, tradition comes from stepping outside of that and not coloring this music at all whatsoever with your own experience and becoming the music that's the idea of listening with your soul you know, that's kind of that's what you were Right, yeah, that's right. right. Okay. And that would be uh in this example the purest form of listening. Right. Okay. I'm just trying to like just differentiate between the, the few because yeah, I feel like in western music we often try to put our own meaning to songs or we try to do it a lot when I hear it I'm like oh, I feel like this could be about this or you know and the music and the tones will give you certain feelings and then obviously the text will You know, describe certain things to you, and then I, and then I relate it to my experiences. It's just something that I do in autopilot, 
But uh, yeah, I just find it interesting too, because I'm trying to, again, thinking from my experiences as I do, playing music with my brother, we'd go into a rehearsal spot, and then we'd come out five hours later, it felt like 15 minutes. We listened to what we recorded, thought it was maybe a five minute passage, and that was almost an hour long that we were jamming that whole thing. Time that usually binds and constrains us and tells us we need to be in places at certain times disappears in that moment when we're in autopilot and we're one with the music and that connection with each other. So I guess that's more playing from your soul. Right. So then the goal is also to then try to listen with your soul as well too, to yeah. others' music, because I feel like that's not something that we do so well here. And it's something I want to, you know, kind of dive into a little bit more. So I'm just trying to differentiate and understand that. So, so that's the idea, basically. Yeah, you're listening. talking on the same lines. Sir. Listening yeah. with yourself. Okay. Absolutely. What is important is that you give your whole self to listening or playing. Mm. Mind cannot be whole. No. Okay. Right? So you have to eventually come from a place which can absolutely be in present and which can actually channel in that which is being given to you. Okay, art happens at a very abstract level. Our mind is not an abstract, it's not an abstract machine, like machine to process abstractness, right? The more abstract your perspective becomes, the better you will become at abstract things. The more tangible things are your subject, the more tangible will be your outcomes. The more intangible will be your perspective, the more intangible will be your life. So how I think, in my personal opinion, when we are doing music, I think I'm connected to this whole atmosphere, or whatsoever you might want to name it, and then channel, it channels into through me. It's not just me doing it, it's a whole universe participating, and all I am participating in uh, this whole cosmic symphony, to say it more humbly. Now, imagine if your channel is this thin. You have this pipe, one mm pipe. That's how much water you, or music gonna come through it. Now you have suddenly opened up a huge passage, like a whole, I don't know, a massive open, that how much music you can actually channel through. So it's all about clearing your channel, trying to actually be of more availability to that eventual source of all creativity. Mm -hmm. Cosmic right. symphony. That's yeah. Like that. yeah. <laughs> I think one of the things that's occurring to me when you're talking is that, I mean, achieving that kind of transcendence mm -hmm. is something that requires a level of dedication and devotion, yeah. which, you know, I think maybe it's a contemporary thing and maybe it's a cultural thing, but the idea of just how much time you have to spend dedicating yourself 100% to music is very different culturally. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I wonder if you could talk a bit about that like the learning process, because I think every accomplished Indian musician I've met went through a time in their life where they were practicing 12 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And that was just, well, of course, this is what you have to do. Correct. Well, for his cis students, like the minimum is five, five hour hours every day. That's what he expects from all this the students. Really <laughs> yeah, I mean, I everyone in this room, if you practice five hours a day, you're like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know? I really went over and above. You know, it's not the minimum <laughs> that I, from my experience, yeah. you know, in kind of contemporary Western culture, we have a very different idea. And I don't know if it's possible to achieve what you're talking about with our dabbling. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would say that whole, the global culture allows you to live a very sporadic life. It's not really focused. We, I'm also a part of it that we do a few things here and then we get tired and then we because so much is accessible nowadays that we want to experience more and that's beautiful, that's wonderful. But there is another way which people can choose to live is to find more in one because there is more in one. There's less in more, and there's more in one. Now, you know, there was this, uh, I want you to all, whosoever is interested, you might already know, uh, read a little bit about uh, Miyamoto Mushashi, a Japanese ronin, okay? Those who know, those who know, just wanted to put it out there. Mm -hmm. So a life devoted to one thing is more um, satisfying. Uh, in the end, you realize that yes, your journey was more meaningful because you were not just going here and there and here and there, but you were oriented and you have just you can look back, oh, I started there and now I'm here. Or some people who just went there and went like, oh, I just started here and I'm here but I walked all the way, it was just a loop and a circle and a circle. Yeah. So in Indian classical music, what is necessary for you 
first first step is to take a very student like stance towards learning okay your student like stance means conquering the technique becoming good friends with the instrument and you know all the techniques you are virtuosic you're fast you can play different ragas you have 10 different ragas under your belt a good repertoire well 10 ragas means a lot well there are over 7000 ragas out there but 10 if you know 10 ragas well enough that you you're, you're asked to play any of those 10 and you can just play it for two hours without repeating anything, that is considered very good. So once that is done, that stage is done, now starts the stage of your self-discovery. And now you have to discover what does these ragas mean to you? And what shape they want to take in you? Now you have created this womb of art in you. Now is the time to give birth to your own art which has your own personal traits. Eventually is the time when you shed both of those. Neither the art that you have learned that is passed down from generation, nor your understanding of it remain, and you just want to be free with it. But learning that first aspect is like, you go to a guru. Nowadays things have changed, it's more commercial set and you go to a guru and guru agrees to teach you and really teaches you. That's very unusual, I'm telling you. Because these three things happen seldom. First of all, you will go to a guru if you were like living 100 years back, even now some places. He would never agree to teach you. <laughs> okay, we'll see. Now eventually, if after two years of you just lingering around him and waiting on the threshold, he says, okay, with pity, he would say, okay, come and sit. Now for the next two years, you're just sitting at the end of the room or at the door, and he's teaching some of his favorite students inside. And you're just out there, listen. Uh, this is fact, guys. And now, on the, after three years, okay, your the dedication has been tested, that's fine. So you can come in and like participate a little bit. And meanwhile, you also, and all this time, you were helping him in his household. You were taking care of the cattle, taking the cattle to the grazing fields, and washing the cattle, and cleaning the floors, and getting his all the things he needed, maybe his hookah filled and all that. But that is that was happening. But teaching wasn't happening. But now eventually you start learning. And that's not it's not easy to get material or things or knowledge from the guru. You have to really please him to a degree that you're worthy, that you can earn it. And then maybe one or two compositions are shown to you. And ex it is expected from you that you practice those two compositions for the next five years and come. Right? So in this whole process, you see what I'm talking here is killing your ego, becoming a devoted student, like choosing your passion over everything else. So all those steps has already happened. Now you're this ready, empty bowl to be filled. So now the teaching actually happens. It's very much of a, of a student learning from his own desire to learn. Student is always greater than the teacher. There's a word called guru, you all know that, right? Guru means from darkness to light. Right, guru, that means guru means darkness, light, ru, okay, from darkness to light. That is just a function of Guru. Guru is neither the darkness nor the light. Guru is just another traveler who goes from darkness to light. He just walks beside you. But it is the choice of the student to walk or not. Right? You cannot be made to do that. And the stories of Guru and Shishya devotion are so important in our culture that we have a whole, you can like write endless books about how devoted students used to be or disciples used to be to their guru. We have stories where students would actually cut off their thumbs and present it as a, as a, as a gift or to the guru's devotion. Like there's a story of Iklavi, and he was this finest archers of all time in India, but he wasn't his guru's favorite. So his guru tells him to go in the forest and practice on his own. And he teaches and at the same time his favorite disciple. One day guru is wandering in the forest and, and is chased by a wolf and Guru is running for his life. Suddenly a volley of arrows appears and it just does not hurt the wolf but fills its mouth with the arrows. 
And Guru is shocked and surprised that how did this happen? And he sees that there's this man, uh, young man with beard and all that, and fails to recognize it's Ekalavya, his own disciple, who actually uh, betrothed, so can sent him to jungle, the forest. Now he goes to Ekalavya, and Ekalavya shows him the statue of the guru he has made, and he has practiced there. So now the cunning guru, because guru has allegiance to the to the other students and their kings and fathers, says that okay, since you have learned it from my statue, you owe me the fees. So I want your thumb as the price, as the piece of it. And he doesn't think a second moment. As soon the words are uttered out of Guru's mouth, I need your thumb, the thumb is presented. So that is the kind of relation between, even I, like, I don't want to sound sentimental or emotional, but if my Guru is telling me the same, I would not hesitate. So this is achieved over time. This kind of devotion is achieved over time. And in that devotion is end of you and the appearance of a true student. Now, as Hazel was telling you about eight hours, 12 hours of, longest I've done is 11 hours in a stretch of practice, mm -hmm. where I felt my, I would never be able to move my leg with me. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I have practiced eight hours. I would actually light a candle and practice with a candle and we'll practice same thing until the candle blows off. Wow. Wow. So that's the technique I found. And in that pursuit, I've also started enjoying making my own candles. <laughs> <laughs> so I can make them as small as I would like. Look at you in the passage of time. In that yeah. sense, too, of burning up a candle, not four hours of practice, <laughs> which is also allowing you to be more free and in that space of being a part of the music. Yeah, that. you're just, it's an art burning there, and you have art happening here, so it's, it's bad. Yeah. Right? So that's how I practice. How many of you practice eight hours? Have you ever practiced eight hours? I have. I'm sure. Before I got really busy with life, but when I was a kid, I used to, I was just lucky that I wanted to do that all the time. And I didn't have any instructors or anyone telling me to do it. I would just run home from school after elementary school and I'd pick up my guitar and put on the radio and just try to play along with every song that I liked. That's, and I would just do that until my parents yell at me to eat dinner and do my homework or go to bed. So that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of my background. That's great. Love and passion and devotion for it. Just, I don't know, it was inherent. I didn't have to go looking for it. It just came to me right away. Very good. And how about now? Now, I wish I had the time to do stuff like that. And I see some of my friends my age, hey, I want to learn how to play guitar. And then you just see how difficult it is with the constraints of time in our lives and how, what needs to be done. And there's only so many hours in the day and so many days in the week. And I look at some other students who have children and stuff like that. So. Right. Compared to them, I'd say I'm playing a little bit more, but you know, now I'm studying theory and stuff like that and writing Bach chorales. I'm not playing it, <laughs> unfortunately. But, but you're still doing music. Still doing music, and I will get back to my guitar with new appreciation because I miss it dearly. But I do, you know, I get to play it every now and then, and there'll be some performances at the end of the semester. But uh, yeah, and it's interesting. Also, just to touch on how you said there is more in one and less in more. And I experienced this in actually in construction and getting into carpentry and it was more of a renovation company. So you do a little bit of everything, which I thought was really great at first, but then I really liked carpentry. So I got into carpentry with another company and I realized how little I knew about carpentry because I'd been running in circles doing a bit of everything. Right. And some of those guys were fantastic, but they had been doing this their whole lives. And some of these guys were 60 something years old and just the stuff they could do easily and just learning from them was quite, Fantastic, but not nearly as spiritual or beautiful as music. I'm not even close to the same thing. So, yeah, that's kind of interesting. Like that's again, like I use my own experiences to make sense of things that people yeah. say when I'm learning, and I try to step outside of that too and just accept it for what it is. But I feel like it's part of the human process of understanding where we've come from to understand where we're going. Like making relations is important. Making relations and then also, like you said, then getting out of your mind and then getting more into your soul and not coloring it the way that I see it. And I feel like we do that a lot too with the issues in the world and stuff like that, right? Like we can get really triggered, somebody can say something that really jars us and something like that, but it's up to us how we react to it. And usually that's our mind causing that and our emotions. It's not our soul at all. Our soul I, like you said, we'd be more pure and accepting of something different than, than that. So, yeah, like you said, and it's like Hazel said too, I feel like that level from, you know, 
listening with your ears than listening with your mind, listening with your soul. I feel like it just takes, you know, maybe not vertically or horizontally, however you want to look at it. I feel like it's such a long uh, span in between. Like there's so much more that has to go into it and just letting go of yourself, letting go of your, like you mentioned, the death of your ego and stuff like that. There's a lot of musicians I've played with that that was their downfall. Incredible musicians, but just right. terrible egos. And I've never understood it because there's always somebody just as good, if not better, that's going to show up. So yeah, I, I think I just really identify with a lot of these values, and I, it's too bad that it took me so long to get into uh, Indian class, you know, uh, Hindustani classical and Indian musical traditions. But I feel like there is now a whole world for me to explore. And, you know, and there you go. Thanks, thanks for uh, making all this really clear because yeah, it was all just ideas in my head coming into class today, and based on what you had studied and whatnot. Yeah, it's, it's starting to make a lot of sense. I'm glad. Yeah, so thanks for your uh, perspective and Thank you. your insight. Thank you. Appreciate it. Have you heard about Phil Spector's recording sessions? Yes. He was a producer in the 60s, mm -hmm. and he would have this room full of musicians, and he his sessions would last 10, 12 hours, yeah. and he wouldn't let them move. They couldn't go and take a bathroom break. And he said it was because other microphones might move and then it won't sound as good. But part of what he was doing was trying to wear down the individuality of musicians. Mm -hmm. So he's trying to take them beyond exhaustion, you know, to the point where they're just they're too tired to try anymore. You know, mm -hmm. he's kind of what is it's a sort of bludgeoning method. Mm -hmm. Right. He's trying to go for the same same kind of thing. Letting the music speak through them at that yeah. point without it being a kind of yeah. adultery. You know, the, the, the irony of it is it's not something you can do with the mind. No, right? no, no. That's you it. have to find another way of doing it because thinking about it is doing the thing that's stopping you from doing it. Yeah. yeah. So that re repetitive, yeah. just repetitive practice. Yeah. You know? I think that's why I'm so drawn to these traditions and less interested in the Western classical stuff. But, you know, because. Well, they make you practice too. Of course, <laughs> <laughs> of course, but you know, I, I like to let go a bit and just become one with the music, and I think that happens a bit less in that tradition, uh, from my experience and from what I've seen. But yeah, that's I think that's a really important part too, and you know, like jamming as well too, just like jamming, playing like free with other people. You know, there's a lot of people like oh, I don't know what to do, I can't do that, I'm thinking too hard about what to play. Yeah. Just just play, yeah. just play yeah. something, something's gonna happen. Don't worry. You know? I had an interesting experience when I first started playing electric guitar, like I knew nothing, like, and I showed up for this um, um, jazz workshop, totally everyone around me knew what they were doing, and me and one other guy knew nothing, nothing, and we had to do this pre-playing where we, just whatever, whatever came to our mind, there were no rules, zero rules, and me and the guy who knew nothing were the most comfortable in that environment, because everyone else, they had so much in their head, in the way, that they were trying to do and trying to find the right note. I didn't know what the right note was. I had no clue. So I just listened and I looked in the eyes of the person and I tried to do what they were doing and respond to what they were doing. And, and it, was, it, it was the most freeing experience to know nothing. You know? Yeah, well. it's, it's interesting that sometimes knowing too much gets in your way. Absolutely. Your mind gets in the way. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, less contrived in your experience then, right? Because you yeah. know, they're trying to just do what they think the perfect thing's going to be. Yeah. And just, you know, yeah. If and you I let just... the music speak through you, then right. that's what I've always said. People are like, oh, you play by feel. Well, that must take a long time to write something. Like, well, yeah, it does. It takes yeah. a really long time to get there. But in the end, you let the music tell you what the song needed. So what could be better than that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Just a, I don't know, kind of off topic, but similar. To please, you. please. Um, in the beginning, we sang a few notes together and started the tonic and then went to a flat seven. And then what was it followed by? Second, flat second. A flat second? Yes. Okay. So for Samgan, those were the three predominant notes used. Different combinations of that. Okay? So if you will go online and look at uh, Samgan or you will look at uh, ancient mantra singing something around that line mm -hmm. you will come across lots of that i i didn't realize that that was something that like i used to go to school for buddhism right and so the monks were always chant with that 
Yes. It was always very comforting. Yes. Mm -hmm. We never think to dismantle it and figure out what it was. Is there a name for that eight beat cycle that you sang earlier? Keherba. What's it called? Keherba. Keherba. How are we doing on time? Um, well, we're, it's 1.45. Okay. Um, we can take as much as feels good, uh, but we do need to be finished by 3.20. And usually we have a break, so if you feel like now's a good time, to take a break, I kind of leave it to you to feel. Uh, we can take your questions and then we can do a break and thereafter I can like demonstrate the cigar and we can listen to something. How's that? Yeah, that's awesome. Yes, please. I, I read from the uh, uh, the news article you posted on Blackboard you once played at Maria using a guitar? Yes. Oh, okay. Can we have like a uh, short snippet of you playing that maybe? I'll play it. I'll play the first line. It sounds better with the orchestra, but it's still you. <laughs> yeah, I recently wrote a piece for a couple of pieces for violin and sitar uh, with uh, Janet. She's a uh, vice principal uh, violinist for VS. And uh, I wrote it in Rag Bhukali, which is a pentatonic rag. You see, there's different pentatonic scales, and that this one has a feeling of a little bit mm, melancholic evening. So when all the birds have gone back to their homes, their nest, and there's still one or two which can't find a, which doesn't have a uh, place to go, that kind of feeling. So it's online, you can look it up. It's called uh, But Hope in the Oops. Yes? If you wanted to explore Indian classical music, um, can you recommend some artists that we should listen to or some collections or just recommendations of what would be great to listen to? Thank you, thank you for bringing that to my attention. When I will be playing some pieces for you, mm -hmm. I will give you some names where you can start your exploration. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch your name. Run. 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 Uh, Run. 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 Run is talking about a big concert. It's Sunday. It's, um, I was talking about the March 26th. Yes, yeah. March 26th, there is a, this concert where several groups of, uh, Different organizations are bringing in their teachers and uh, students to perform Indian classical music and dance. Mm -hmm. It's March 26th at Surrey Arts Center, and I'm sure the detail will be on the Surrey Arts Center website. So if anybody of you is interested, I will highly motivate you on to participate. Rani Ji will also be performing there as a part mm -hmm. of our mm -hmm. group of students. Yeah. Would that be a good place to look if I were to be interested in taking some sitar lessons or playing some sitar? We can talk about that. Yeah. 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 I can help you. Okay. But first you have to go find someone else to wash their cattle. Wash their cattle. Too bad you don't have any cattle. I don't have to go and find some cattle. I'll wash the cattle, but I need these thumbs. I broke my thumb once and I was useless and it made me realize how crucial these My car can systems. use a water. Yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Does anyone have any more questions before we just go? No, that was a minute. Okay, so let's let's take fifteen minutes so if we can start to forget about